So Andrew led into what we're going to talk about next, which is cybersecurity assessments. So you've all you all saw this already. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this and obviously where cybersecurity assessments fit in is this beginning awareness part. A lot of organizations, uh, as Andrew said, originally there's this idea that they think that they have great control of their cyber. I, I have found over the last couple of years, there's been a fundamental shift because of a lot of talk and a lot of news about ransomware. People are asking the question. When they're asking the question internally, they're finding out that they don't really have a great plan and that IC62, sorry, what? You know, they don't know the standards, right? And as was mentioned earlier, uh, the fundamental difference between IT cybersecurity and OT. Um, almost every place we go, we find out that it's not, your company is no different. There is a divide between IT and OT, and there's very good reasons for why it exists. And it happened, started a long time ago, it's old history. Anyone who's been in tech long enough knows how IT organizations gained a lot of power in corporations over the last X number of years. Now, there have always been the people who are responsible for making the actual product. And those people, for better or for worse, end up with a chip on their shoulder about, hey, we're the ones that actually make this stuff, right? And then an IT person comes in there, runs the scan, and takes out their process network. And then they're like, those guys in IT, and before you know it, you're having these kind of conversations. It's almost... Uh, it would be funny if it wasn't so costly, right? Uh, and so what we find is part of what we're doing when we talk about assessments is getting in there. And, and I joke about it, that there is a, having a third party in there to almost be like a therapist, to be like, hey, listen, we're the ones you can talk to about this. And when we talk to each different team, we get different angles, right? Some organizations are mature enough that they actually are ready to have the conversation and they've already started the, the mending of fences required between the organizations, but many have not. And that's, that's where, when we get to this, what the assessment is about, is getting to this moving from awareness to visibility to the oh wow moment. This oh wow moment is really when they see a, a list of, okay, listen, we, we have found out that your network is, is, is extremely flat, unfortunately, and as Andrew mentioned, your crown jewels are just inside the front door of your castle. and. There are ways to fix that. And here are, what we try to do, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, is give a very clear list of like the difference between something that is high risk and high cost, high risk, low cost. There's some medium risk stuff that you can kind of go, look, let's talk about it. And that's where we do get to the point where we go, okay, so where are you at organizationally? And are you guys ready to spend the money to move your organization up this path, right? Because when we get to the point where after, oh, wow, we get to firefighting, that's when we're doing things like, okay, we're going to implement network segmentation. We're going to, if, if they are a really highly secure uh, location and they actually say they want SL4, sometimes we will have a serious conversation with them like, do you understand what SL4 means? Because it does mean a much higher level of implementation and a much higher cost, obviously. So that's why Andrew says in most cases, SL3 is going to be sufficient for most of our, our clients. Now we get to this point where we're talking about, you know, in the purple and the darker, uh, I guess it's mauve and purple, I don't know. Um, you're talking about integration to optimization. And integration meaning your IT and your OT teams are starting to become, maybe friends is a strong word, but collaborators or cooperators. And they're reaching a point where there is a, a what we call a SOC, a security operations center. Often because of the way organizations work, that's gonna land in your IT sphere. So trying to build those relationships so that OT, the core part is that IT doesn't understand how <coughs> sensitive process equipment is. And to your point about, you know, this idea, well, why can't you just patch it? We're just gonna patch it. And you're like, the process controller is in the middle of, you know, a, whatever, let's say semiconductor is <coughs> a really good example. You know, like the semiconductor fab plants, if you have a shutdown in any part of your, your semiconductor fab process, it is enormously expensive. Uh, I don't have one of those slides in here, but there's there's certain slides by industry of how much it costs per day, and it's just the kind of stuff that makes you know makes your hair stand on end when you read it. So, <laughs> to get to this point where you're in integration and optimization is possible, but it is the hallowed ground, and as Andrew mentioned, it's only about ten percent of organizations who get to this point. Um, so, where are we we interestingly enough, because we're the global cybersecurity solutions and services team at Schneider. As Andrew mentioned, we're not on the product security side. Uh, we work with those teams. We're aware of 
We're aware of patches. We're aware of what they call zero day events. But in across, we're, we're, we're platform agnostic. So <clears throat> it doesn't matter if you're a Schneider house or a Rockwell house or a Emerson house or Honeywell house, whatever it is, we kind of look at the spaces as Andrew and I always talk about the spaces between the devices. And how do you figure out how to make your entire cybersecurity posture at this level where you know what's happening on your network and you know how to react to it? I mean, the optimization level is where you're like, in real time, <clears throat> nothing gets you. You're always aware. This is, it's, it's uh, costly, but worth it to get there. It just depends on the nature of the cost of your risk, right? Some organizations do the, you talk to the CEOs, you get to that cost benefit analysis and they go, you know what? That's an acceptable level of risk for us. And then sometimes we're talking about insurance and they're like, we're just going to make sure we're insured highly for that. And then, okay, we've given you our advice. Um, you know, we're always happy to help, but at some, sometimes we say go with God, <laughs> you know, uh, because if you're not, you're not going to protect yourselves, it's going to be challenging, right? So Andrew mentioned IEC 6443, but there are a number of standards that go on top of, of how to, everybody, as you know, there's always different ways uh, to get to the same, uh, similar results, right? And so on the IT side, there's this NIST 800-52, which is this, this really wide ranging, and probably many people in this room have heard about it. And it, it's, um, or is it 53? I'm not sure, but it, the, the IT version one, is this massive, as they say, uh, mile wide, inch deep standard that says here are general standards for how you should handle your IT network. They came up with uh, an addendum to that. It sort of matches with IEC 6443 called NIST 800-82. Some organizations are more keyed into this one. Some, uh, we lead with 6443 because it's the OT specific one that started from the ground up in OT. Um, but often, some, some corporations are so savvy that they're like, we're going to pick these controls from NIST, these controls from IEC. They kind of make their own homebrew. Very rarely are we working with clients that are that savvy about their OT cybersecurity posture. But when they are, we can help. Uh, obviously, NERC SIP, there are people in this room that are very concerned with uh, NERC SIP compliance because of what they do. Um, certain high-level utilities end up having to be held to certain standards that are regulated. Now... You know, if you're lucky, you're in an industry where you're not actually forced to, to, to be cyber secure, but there's some balance. There's some, uh, sometimes it would be good if we made a forced industry to be cyber secure. There'd be a lot less risk, but, but we get why uh, we, have, we live in a free country, right? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the big things about an assessment, uh, you know, I'm going to talk a bit about goals, is that trying to figure out what are, what is obviously your industrial control system? What is your, what was your network architecture, right? That's when we talk about flat networks. We all know that um, the way corporations grow and expand a uh, manufacturing footprint of any kind is, it'd be lovely to say that it was just like one to two to three, then they, they, they grew perfectly organically and they considered cybersecurity at every step. A lot of the problems in an industrial network is that it was designed in sections, ad hoc, different teams, different budgets. And every time there's a new team and there's a new layer, some, somebody, you know, they could have air gapped this industrial control system perfectly. It's a, it's a perfectly balanced network. Mm -hmm. And then some new guy goes, hey, I've got this Zigbee device and they plug it in or something that just basically jumps many levels and is now talking to something over a wireless connection that somebody else threw in there because they're you know, maybe younger and, uh, and they don't know the implications of this. And they're like, well, of course you want internet in this room, right? And as Andrew said, you'd never want that to be the situation. So a lot of what a security or cybersecurity assessment will get to the bottom of, first of all, what components, what assets you have speaking on your network, what your network architecture actually is. Um, you know, we talk about as built, and I prefer to call them was built or once was built or maybe not built. Like it's, it's unfortunate, but keeping up to date as built is very challenging and costly. So people don't do it. The questions that get asked, and I'll go more into this in a minute, is like, what, what are your cybersecurity policies and procedures? A lot of times, it's nobody quite knows who's responsible for it. Sometimes it's clear. Uh, we, sometimes we get lucky where they've talked about it and they're really organized. Um, physical security is obviously a big part of it. How, how uh, this was the old school method, you know? Uh, basically, if you couldn't get to the room, I, I, I've been in a million uh, control rooms where I was like, okay, I get it. There's like, that lock, that lock, and then there's the security here, there's that system still active. <clears throat> That's sometimes where you go, okay, well, this is one where we, we wouldn't maybe don't have to advise you to do massive changes, but 
please tell me if you're gonna someone's gonna put a new workstation in here to play video games because they're bored, right? Because that does happen, you know. We've seen it. So, uh, and you know, sitting and looking at a control screen all day, we kind of get why they might want to do that sometimes, right? Um, what is the level of cybersecurity training for your personnel? Uh, have they been trained uh, on the basics of of uh, cybersecurity in the OT environment? Um, is there a documented incident incident response procedure? What happens when something happens? You know, what is the, is there a life cycle management happening? Uh, and like they say, role-based security practices, who's responsible for what? So in the use cases, obviously, as I mentioned, there's this IT, OT, IOT, asset discovery, right? Trying to figure out what you have. Life cycle vulnerability management, okay. What, when, when does a product go end of life? You know, we have a client recently we were talking to uh, of an agency and their primary firewall Turns out when end of life in 2006 and uh, end of support in 2011. And they didn't they didn't know that until we we just asked what the part number was. So the basics that that is going to be a very busy assessment for us. Uh, there's going to be a lot for us to figure out for them. But but the good news is they're not talking to us, right? So so when when does something go end of life? Uh, when when uh, how how do you know into internal to your organization who's responsible for determining when uh, patching needs to happen on a specific uh, PLC. We'd love to say that everything gets designed without what they call zero day events, but we're finding out even now the supposedly perfect iPhones uh, have these zero day events. I mean, we won't scare the hell out of everybody with some of the stuff that's come out recently, but there is, if, if you're a target and they want to get access to your iPhone and everything on your iPhone, there, there's people who could do it. Obviously, we're talking about state actors here. We're not talking about, you know, your buddies from college who want to make fun of you, right? They probably aren't going to be able to do that, but but there are, there are unfortunately things like that with devices. So what devices are no longer supported and planned for upgrades, right? Um, obviously audit and compliance to figure out how you comply. It's just like what you mentioned for NERC SIP for certain clients. Uh, if you're acquiring an organization, this is actually a really massive one. Uh, companies, uh, well, Schneider, as you know, we, we actually do acquire quite a, quite, a, quite a few companies and a big part of what we, we uh, you know, as we often say we drink our own champagne. We definitely are going to want to check out to see what kind of risks we would be inheriting. Uh, companies like Microsoft and all these are constantly acquiring small companies, and they're always trying to have to look at footprint. But when you're talking about large manufacturers, they're they're in, they're buying entire plants or portfolios of plants. So there's a lot of basically it's oft, often how they start. I think with uh, cybersecurity assessments, um, and of course incident response. You know, uh, trying to figure out what not only what would you get out of the assessment for what you need to change, but what are they going to do in the future so they're prepared. And then this is just, uh, I won't go into super detail here, but obviously the findings are going to be listed various levels at the end of an assessment. We have different levels of assessment. There's some people who just go, no, we just want a basic asset inventory. Just That's all we want. There's other ones where what we call an L1 assessment where we'll do a much a, like a bit, a bit of a deeper dive. We have a client in particular that is trying to, I think, kind of move towards best in class. They hired us to be like, okay, we're, we're gonna want you to help us look at every one of our plans. We're gonna develop a custom, uh, basically assessment template. And then we're gonna try to do those assessments in a regular interval, not every year, but like to go, okay, here's your scoring on, based on IEC 6443 and a reference architecture that that client has created, a cybersecurity architecture. We're gonna try to give the plants, and this is also where I'm sure those of you in certain organizations will get this. Sometimes you're not specifically, you can't tell that plant, you have to do this and you must install these and get to work. And, you know, like we've had, in fact, a lot of our clients are like, we would love it if you could kind of help us, you know, uh, we are sort of in charge of them. Like it's this weird dot the line thing where they are the bosses, but they know that that plant is, they're, they're, they're in control and they learn the hard way. You can't just dictate, mandate, policy change. So so out of these kind of reports, what happens is we can say, hey, all right, so these are the things we've we found and here's how you could improve your posture if we continue. Um, so the questions to sort of ask yourself are related to what we've already talked about. You know, do, do you know all the assets that are connected to your network? Uh, I found that almost everybody scratches their head a little bit at this question and says, well, we have some idea, but... Um, this is where we start to talk about the assessment more clearly. Um, 
you know, can you tell me what your riskiest, riskiest vulnerabilities are like right now, right this minute, not, not uh, in the future at this minute. Uh, and a lot of times people, it's an anxiety and these are anxiety inducing questions. So, uh, you know, to make sure you do some self care after you think about this, you know, take some time to just oh, meditate. Uh, because a lot of times there isn't the answers to these are not good answers. They're like, I, ah, uh, sometimes, you know, we say who, who, who is responsible for cybersecurity in your organization? And uh, an OT manager will go, oh, it's supposed to be me. It's the seventh hat they threw at me after you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do this, right? So I get that this is the one that maybe keeps people up at night. So obviously the low one's the last time you did an assessment, but also cybersecurity posture, when you bring vendors into your location, unfortunately you're bringing their policies with you to some extent, depending on how you set up your remote access or if you allow them to have remote access. So there's a lot of questions you have to, if you don't know what your vendor's policies are, it's, um, you know, we talk about cybersecurity hygiene. Uh, you could be bringing vendors in your house if you haven't had this conversation about like, well, what, what is, how do you guys navigate uh, cybersecurity as a organization? Who within your company, when you have secure remote access or not secure, but just remote access, should I say, a lot of times, who's responsible for updating the credentials? Who, whose job is it to remove, or as Andrew showed, they, these credentials get sold uh, on, on uh, dark websites and stuff like that. So, so the, these are the kind of questions, right? So quickly, just to talk about what we are, our, our team is something that started out uh, probably about uh, 18 years ago in the land, more of what we call process automation. So that would be uh, industries where the cost of downtime was so high, like oil and gas or chemical manufacturing. And, and I think things like uh, that, that's sort of why we have these, you know, six regional hubs and you can kind of see the large green dots are all throughout the world, but you can see we got a big one in Dubai because there's a lot of, uh, you know, in the, that's where it started. But over the years, we've sort of uh, branched into the last, you know, 19 years or 18 years, we've branched into our team specifically, me specifically, I'm focused on non uh, process automation oriented work. So industry like uh, consumer packaged goods, uh, life sciences. Uh, personally, I work on water, wastewater a lot, transportation, uh, federal work and stuff like that. But we ended up having, you know, 17 district offices, 50 plus consultants and over 150 field engineers. And honestly, with the way uh, the conversation has shifted, uh, we're very confident that our team is, is going to be scaling uh, quite fast, uh, continue to grow. So. Uh, I won't go into this because Andrew, Andrew essentially talked about this sort of how to how to figure out how to how you would do a, a cybersecurity design to implement for for your portfolio of uh, locations. These are some of the services that we provide. We won't go into that, but this is the idea of that same maturity model. That there are a lot of things you can start to do as you move up the maturity model. Um, some people we've had it where they're like, "Hey, we, we'd love to have you guys come and do some pen testing for us." And we'll go, well, you know, you don't want to do pen testing if you don't really know what you have and you haven't built, it's not going to be, it's like, it's like basically taking the exam without studying for the test, right? Like we want to make sure that you, let's not break anything. Let's, let's, let's have a, let's have a deeper conversation on the assessment side to figure out what you need to do first before we start getting into the point where we now think you have a, we've achieved SL4, SL3. That's when pen testing can happen, be useful. Uh, obviously, pen testing on an industrial control network isn't always something as Andrew hinted, like enterprise level stuff means so and so spreadsheet didn't load so fast and hope you saved your work. Now in the world of autosave, like we're not that stuff doesn't end up having massive implications, but a process line is very serious. So, um, you know, I think I sort of covered it, but this was a success story. I don't think we need to go into it on, in the interest of time. Um, so I, I, overall, you know, Andrew and I are both available to answer any questions. We'll also, uh, I think you've got to run around noon or so or in the afternoon, yeah. in the afternoon and I've got to run around uh, 2 p.m. But we'll, we'll be around if I know some of these questions are sensitive enough that you may not want to ask them in an open room. Uh, we've definitely, uh, we know that's the case with a lot of clients. And uh, But also, if any questions you have now, uh, please uh, feel free to ask.